Hey guys, welcome back to ADBC History. My name's Dan and today I'm going to tell you about the amazing archaeological history of Ukraine, a country which is obviously in the news quite a lot at the moment. One of the reasons why this area is so interesting is not only because of the incredible archaeological finds that have been discovered there over the course of the last century, but also because, unfortunately, the Russian government has a long history of covering up Ukraine's history and using it to fuel its own propaganda, not only right now in the course of the current war and occupation, but also through the USSR period and through the communist period. So I chose to make this video in order to shed more light on the amazing history of Ukraine, not only in its modern state sense, but also through the full length of its human history and the area's occupation by human beings. For this reason, I'm not going to talk about the Slavic period that Ukrainian history is most known for, and the Kiev period, and everything that correlates roughly to what we would call the medieval period and onwards in Western Europe. We're going to go back a lot further in time. We're going to go all the way back to the Neolithic period, or what we would call the Stone Age. We're going to talk about a culture called the Tripilia culture, which was based in Ukraine and also some parts of what is today uh, Romania and Moldova around the 5,500s to 2,700s BC, right? So that's six to three millennia ago. Not centuries, millennia, right? Nearly eight to f six, five, <laughs> maths is not my strong point, a, a long t thousand years ago, right? A long time ago. And I'd, I'd like you to keep that in mind throughout this video as we talk about all of the various you know, degrees of you know, sophistication and social organization that are apparent through the archaeological findings that have been found here, right? This is an impressively long time ago for the stuff that has been found um, and for what we know about the Trophilia culture, the, sorry, the Trophilia culture and its level of organization, right? Uh, I apologize in advance for my horrendous pronunciation. I do not speak Ukrainian or Russian, though I imagine if you come from either of these countries, then you currently probably ha probably have bigger problems. But um, if you know how to pronounce these names properly, then please leave me a comment down below so that I can be publicly embarrassed. Thank you. Awesome, cool. So we're going to talk about the Tripilia culture today, which is also known as the Cucuteni Tripilia culture or the Tripoli culture. Um, and it's known from the village of Tripilia in the Kiev region of Ukraine, which is where this culture was first identified. Um, let's talk for a moment about what a culture is in archaeology, right? A culture broadly is a whole bunch of sites that share similar enough features that we can say that they're related, right? In a lot of civilizations in world history, they didn't have a system of writing or they didn't have one that we know how to understand or where there's enough evidence for it. Um, so we don't always know, in fact, we quite rarely know how a group of people described themselves or where a given group of people would define their own limits, right? There weren't convenient maps and atlases floating around like there are today where, you know, the borders of France can be quite precisely found and everyone on this side is in Germany and everyone on this side is in France and everyone on this side is in Switzerland, right? Um, it didn't work like that in the ancient world, you know? There, everyone was probably under the control of some government or some king or other, but, you know, there were lots and lots of minor ethnic groups everywhere, you know, from valley to valley in different areas. There could be completely different languages. So the only thing that we can do as modern archaeologists is look for similarities and differences to try and find a sense of where one culture ends and another begins, right? Because it's always blurry. There's always a, a grey area in you know, transition zones and frontier zones between different empires and different kingdoms and different nationalities, right? And again, without written evidence to give us language, which is usually the the gold standard of demarcation of one culture to another because you know these people speak one thing and these people speak another and you know the language that you speak is a huge part of how you identify yourself and who you are, view yourself as being similar to and, and not right but there's always a process of exchange between different cultures that border on each other and so the people who live on the periphery of an area are always going to be you know a, a little bit of a mix of everyone around them as well right so when we call something a culture in archaeology, it means that we have a bunch of sites in a given area and the evidence that is found at those sites looks more similar to each other 
than it does to the things outside of what we define that culture, right? In the case of the Trapilia culture, that means in this area that I just spoke about in modern Ukraine and Romania and Moldova, it means that the sites that we found there, the material evidence like artwork and pottery and you know, um, the proto-writing system that these guys are known to have had, which means uh, uh, symbols that were progressing towards a writing system but weren't quite there yet, they look more like each other than they do the other things around them, which we define as being of a different culture, right? What this doesn't mean is that everyone who was part of this quote-unquote culture was part of the same nation or part of the same kingdom or tribe or something like that. It's quite possible that there were many different nations or, you know, different forms of government. There could have been some kings and some, you know, democracy or whatever. There's no evidence to suggest that these places were necessarily democratic. I'm just throwing that out there as an example, right? But just keep this in mind. Whenever you hear about archaeologists talking about Minoan culture or, you know, um, Proto-Indo-European culture, particularly going really far back, um, it's... We don't know for sure that this was one group of people who identified themselves as one group of people. All we can do is look at a given number of sites, and even though there will always be individual differences between them, because as I said, when you're on the border of somewhere, you're always in exchange with everybody else. And so even if all the sites within this area are of a given culture, the ones on this side will be exchanging with the people over here, and the ones on this side will be having cultural exchange with the people over here, so they will still be slightly different to each other, but they're more similar to each other than they are with everybody else, right? Long-winded explanation, but it's an important concept for you to understand, right? So, back to the Trapilia culture. Let's talk about the terrain of Ukraine for a second. So Ukraine is a broad and mostly flat area with lots of grassy green plains. This means it's amazing for livestock um, and also for farming, right? Very agriculturally productive area. Great place to live if you're a human being. Um, this also means that it may have possibly been the first place where horses were used by human beings, either you know to pull things like wagons and plows and whatever, or actually for riding on. Um, stirrups hadn't been invented yet, so people would have been riding bareback or uh, you know, with maybe some kind of reins or even just, I don't know, hanging onto the mane for dear life. But uh, yeah, there is some evidence, not conclusive, but there is some evidence to suggest that this is the first time and place that horses were used by humans in our history, right? So this already gives you an idea of what this kind of area is going to be like. If it's broad and flat, it has few natural boundaries like mountain ranges, which is one of the things that are chopped up Greece so nicely uh, throughout the classical period and the archaic period and meant that there could be so much regional variation of Greek culture because there are strong boundaries separating people from each other, right? Doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of regional variation in the Trapilia culture as well, but um, you get, you tend to get lots and lots of small countries when you have lots and lots of natural barriers, whereas when you've got a wide open area, you tend to get, uh, you know, one kind of large nation or, um, you know, or group identity, even if they follow different leaders, right? Um, because it's just so much easier to travel around and to range from one place to the next, right? It also tells you that it's very likely that their main method of warfare, if they had horses, um, was cavalry warfare, right? Cavalry or any kind of guys on horseback, they like room to manoeuvre. They like to have lots of space so they can kind of charge in and get stuck in and then run away again, right? Because a guy on a horse only has an advantage for the first couple of seconds of the fight and then he can get easily surrounded by the, you know, when it's when it's packed, the horse is too big to kind of manoeuvre easily and dudes on foot can quickly surround them and just come at them from every angle and, and stab the horse or stab the dude and, and they're pretty much screwed, right? So they like to be able to charge in, make an impact and get the hell out of there. Whereas infantry or guys who are fighting on foot, they like to have, again, those natural boundaries around them, like mountains or rivers or forests or something to secure their flanks and their rear so that cavalry can't come around them and gather them from the sides, right? And they like to stand in closely packed formations. And again, this is why the Greeks fought in their famous phalanx formation, where very you know, densely packed, you know, overlapping shields, all kind of packed in there together and then, you know, charge each other from the front. Um, because of those mountain ranges and stuff meant that, you know, an infantry formation could realistically fill the width of a given valley or something like that. And particularly at the Battle of Thermopylae, which I'm sure you've all heard of, that was exactly what happened, right? But in Ukraine, um, great area for cavalry, lots of room to maneuver, charge, run away, and also plenty of open pasture land to raise all of those horses, 
which is something they couldn't do in Greece because there's just not enough flat, grassy land in order to support a large population of horses. So even though the Greeks did have cavalry, they didn't use it very much or very effectively. And um, the last thing I'll say about the culture as an overall is that this civilization was actually evolving along similar lines to the city-states of the Near East, uh, in, you know, such as Ur and the Sumerians and so on and so forth. So as I said, there are evidence of symbols that were precursors to a writing system. They were on the way to developing a, a full system of writing until their civilization unfortunately fell apart. Um, and so this area could have potentially been one of the competitors for the title of Cradle of Civilization, which is what we call um, Northern Mesopotamia, or what is today Northern Iraq. Unfortunately, pretty much exactly correlates to the, the homeland of ISIS at the moment, which is a uh, real pain for archaeologists. Um, but what we call the Fertile Crescent, which is a, a, uh, an area along a band of mountains in northern Iraq, roughly, um, where the first cities were built and um, the first evidence for settled agriculture uh, is, is found to have existed and then the first evidence for writing and, and so on and so forth. Um, but these guys in the Trapilia culture were actually doing a lot of the same things early, you know, like about the same time or even slightly earlier than they were doing in the Middle East. Um, so, yeah, it had history been different, it's possible that we would have actually been talking about Ukraine as the oldest area of human quote-unquote civilization, and I mean civilization in the cities and agriculture sense. Of course, people who are nomadic, you know, have an equal, equally valid and claim to the title of having a civilization. We're not, you know, we don't think like Western people from the 1800s anymore. If you live on a horse and you travel around all the time, that's your lifestyle. You know, that's an equally valid civilization as living in a city, right? But in terms of that Western definition of civilization, Ukraine could have been its homeland if it wasn't for the fact that they suffered a climate shift towards the end of their, their period of, of, uh, of existence, I guess. Um, so as I said, Ukraine, very grassy area. Um, that means it's got great rainfall to keep all those plants alive. But unfortunately, there was a kind of climate shift which happens in regions around the world uh, every so often. Um, over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years, not like global warming where it's happening, you know, in a process of years and even months. Um, and so the climate uh, dried out and that mean that there, was, that there wasn't nearly as much rainfall, there wasn't as much moisture to water the plants, um, and so there wasn't as much food, they couldn't have as big of a population, and so the whole civilization declined markedly. And you know, all of the, the art and the other things that we see that typify this culture kind of died out, right? Didn't mean that people weren't living there, but there wasn't as many of them and they probably weren't as politically powerful, right? Cool, so probably the thing that the Trapilia culture is most known for archaeologically is what we call their mega settlements, right? The Trapilians, lacking any better name for them, built these amazing, massive settlements that just are way beyond the scale of anything else, anything that they should have been in this period of history, right? So as I was saying over in the Fertile Crescent, Ur and Samaria are building the first cities, right? And uh, a, t a town or a city with a population of several thousand people of, you know, between one to four or five thousand people was at the time a really big deal, right? And then for a long time, archaeologists believed that those were the largest settlements in the world. They were the, it was the New York and the Beijing of the world was having five thousand people in your town, right? And then they found the Trapilia mega settlements, which at a conservative estimate had a population of at least 20,000 people up to, on the high end, possibly up to around 50,000 people living in them at any one time, right? Now, there's a reason we don't call them cities, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. We're calling them mega settlements, and it has to do with whether they were actually occupied all year round. Um, but suffice to say that this area in Ukraine was home to what were undoubtedly the largest settlements of anywhere in the world at this time. Nothing in the Middle East or in China or in Central America or let alone in Europe, where I'm pretty sure people were still mostly living in caves at this point, can possibly compete with, at least from the evidence that is known and the, the archaeological sites that have been excavated in the world, can compete with what was going on in Ukraine at this period. So as I said, this actually makes Ukraine a very significant archaeological area. Um, so a bunch of really smart archaeologists got this 
machine which measures magnetic anomalies in the soil, right? I'm pretty sure these things are mounted on wheels uh, and you sort of roll them over a given area and it builds up a two-dimensional map of the magnetic fields that are going on under the soil, right? Because when the, the soil kind of settles via a process of sedimentation, you know, like a, like a river washing over something or just, you know, dust just blowing and accreting and you know, all of the other processes through which soil builds up over thousands and thousands of years, which is why archaeologists have to dig for stuff. You know, it's not just sitting there on the surface anymore because it's been covered. Um, when that happens, there's a fairly uniform kind of magnetic like spectrum through the whole thing, right? And then when you dig and you disturb the soil and you mix all those molecules and, and particles around, um, the magnetic stuff gets all mixed up. And even what's nearly 10,000 years later, the evidence of that digging is still really visible in the, uh, the magnetic archaeological record, right? So they get this machine, they roll it over the area, and it builds up this amazing, um, this amazing map of what's going on under the surface without having to actually excavate it, which, given it's an area this large, would take, like, hundreds of years would not, absolutely just not be possible and it also reveals things like you know stone that are underneath the, the surface as well right if you find a rock it's going to be shaped kind of circularly if you find a rock that is suspiciously rectangular it was probably put there by a human and it was probably carved and shaped because rocks just don't turn out rectangular in real life as anyone who's ever gone outside would know um so i'm going to throw a map up on the screen for you to look at of a site called Maidanetsky in ukraine and before I go on, I should just mention that um, none of these houses and things were being built out of stone. They were build, being built out of wood and mud, like a wattle and daub kind of construction. But that's just another use of this technology in other areas. But this stuff was all wood. Anyway, so the map that you should be seeing on the screen right now is um, a map of what's been found with the magnetic measurements of one of the Trapelia megasites. Um, and as you can see, it's absolutely freaking enormous, right? There's a central area in the middle where it's believed that cattle were kept. Um, that probably would have been overnight, I'm assuming, and then they would have been let out during the day with the shepherds to go and kind of forage, but they're brought in in the night time so that no one can steal the cattle and, you know, raiders from other tribes or whatever could not pinch, the, pinch them because they would have been a, a very valuable asset as livestock pretty much universally are throughout ancient history. And then what's something that's interesting is that the houses are built around this central area in concentric rings, right? And this is really odd because if you look at any cities that are reasonably old, the maps of them are always a complete and utter shit fight, right? There's never a nice, you know, like grid pattern like there is in a modern, you know, recently founded city like New York or somewhere. Um, except in, you know, like there are cases like the, the Greeks started building cities on a grid layout by at least the Hellenistic period, I think, if not maybe the classical period. Um, but then if you look at Athens, for example, which was founded well before that, you know, it's obviously centered around the Acropolis, but then the streets around it are just an absolute mess, you know? The people would just build houses wherever they felt like it and okay no that's not true some of the streets today are actually more grid like but they're, they're more modern but if you look at ancient Athens or you know any of or modern London for example you look at London the streets just go in all directions right because people would just build houses wherever they felt like it and the roads have kind of um, evolved to match that rather than the other way around. The roads didn't come first. The houses came first and the roads came second, right? So usually ancient cities, when you look at them, are just a complete hodgepodge of everything, right? Or they're laid out on a grid, which is very sensible. This concentric rings thing, on the other hand, is really weird, right? And so you can see, like, there's almost multiple layers that kind of go outwards, like an onion. Shrek would love this. Um, so, like, you know, what, what does this tell us? Does this mean that they went through deliberate phases of expansion where they, you know, knocked down the wall and then built another wall a certain distance further out and sort of expanded the city? Or were they adding one layer of houses at a time and, like, you know, doing another layer every, like, you know, 20 years or something? Or, yeah, so archaeologists don't know what the point is of these concentric rings, but it's interesting and it indicates something was going on. So I guess stay tuned for another video in 10 years and I might be able to tell you what was going on there. There's something else really interesting about the Trapelia mega settlements, and I'm just going to. Good.
There's something else that's really interesting about the Tropilia megacellinus, um, and that's that consistently across all 19 of them, and actually I might just mention before I go on, um, not all of the Tropilians lived in mega settlements. There were lots of much smaller towns and villages that were spaced a couple of kilometers apart, small, uh, very densely populated, that sort of filled the landscape in between the mega settlements, right? So they weren't only living in these things. There was lots of little towns as well, right? But for the mega settlements, there's something weird about them, which is that consistently across all 19 of them that have been found, they are all consistently seem to have been burnt down and then rebuilt in exactly the same way every 50 to 70 to 80 years, right? This is profoundly weird because it doesn't match a pattern of destruction that you would see when a city is conquered and raised to the ground, right? When cities are destroyed by, say, a foreign invader or a natural disaster, there's usually a period with no occupation afterwards, right? Which means that humans don't live there, or at least they live there in much, much smaller numbers. And then usually, you, like, you'll get, where there used to be a big city, there'll be, like, a small village, and then it might possibly, no, not necessarily, grow over time to become a much, back to the sort of size that it was and then beyond, right? Um, and, you know, there are a couple of reasons for this. It's because when uh, a city gets burned to the ground, usually the people who burned it down are still around somewhere in the vicinity, and so you don't just go and start rebuilding the city because the people who burned it down probably wouldn't take very kindly to that, and then they'll come and burn you down as well, right? Um, also, you know, raising a city to the ground and killing everyone inside it tends to kind of produce some bad vibes, uh, bad religious vibes, bad general vibes. So people don't really want to live there for a bit because, you know, understandably, there's some pretty terrible memories of the place. Um, and also things like, you know, corpses falling in wells and stuff, you know, poisons the, the water. Um, it's just an area that's generally not fit for habitation for a while, right? Um, but yeah, so what, what, what happened here is that the Tropilians burned this entire place, or someone burned this entire place to the ground, and then someone went in and immediately afterwards, so there was no period of, of no occupation, they went in there and rebuilt the place exactly the same way that it used to be, right? So as I was just saying, when humans are left to their own devices to build towns, they build a, a stir fry essentially, and you know, the roads go everywhere and, and there, there's no you know, reason or order to the, the way it's it's built, right? And when cities are destroyed and then rebuilt, they usually don't stick to the same pattern. They'll kind of do things a different way, right? Unless they have a, a, a particular attachment to the old layout, you know, like a site of a given temple or something like that, right? Um, or unless they're reusing um, foundations or building materials that are big and difficult to move, such as large stone blocks, right? Now, we know that they weren't using large stone blocks in this area, so we can probably mostly fall back on the, the first point, which is that they had a particular attachment to the exact way that this city was laid out, right? So they're going and rebuilding the houses in the same spots. They're not, you know, the the if, if you look at the, the map of Maidanetsky, the oval is, it's it's staying in the same oval. It's not rotating a bit. It's not, you know, moving slightly. It's, it's, it's the same. The walls are being rebuilt in the same spot. Um, and that just doesn't make any sense unless... The Tropilians burned down their own mega settlement and then went back and rebuilt it in exactly the same way, deliberately, right? It can't have been an accident, it can't have been, um, you know, destruction, whatever, um, you know, it can't have been a big fire that swept through the place. And also because it's so consistent, this not only that happened at all of the mega settlements, but also the time frame of usually about 60 to 80 years, possibly 50 to 70. Um, the time frame does vary slightly, but the general gist of it is consistent across all the mega settlements, right? So again, archaeologists don't have an explanation for why this is the case, but it's absolutely fascinating. You know, was there, was this some kind of like religious process where they, you know, went through a process of renewal where they felt the need to destroy these settlements and then, you know, rebuild them and to kind of like symbolize something? Was it like a, um, you know, was it like a transition period between one regime to the next when, you know, a king or a, an oligarchy or something, you know, the old one left and the new one comes in or, you know, uh, there's, yeah, there, there are so many possibilities for what this is. Uh, if you have any interesting ideas, by all means, chuck them in the comments down below and we can have an interesting conversation about it, right? 
And uh, there's one last interesting thing to say about these mega settlements, which is that archaeologists speculate that these sites weren't inhabited all year round, right? And that they were actually meeting places for various groups in the surrounding, from the surrounding landscape for a specific reason, right? So remember I mentioned those little small settlements that dotted the landscape. Some archaeologists, not all, think that most people, or all the people, lived in these small settlements most of the time, and then some of the time, for a specific reason, they would migrate into these big mega settlements, which were empty, or maybe only had a very small like you know, caretaker population for the rest of the time. Perhaps, again, there was a religious reason, you know, there was some kind of festival that they were celebrating or, uh, you know, a sporting event, um, a, ro a royal or aristocratic ceremony, you know, like a new king's being crowned, a new government's being inaugurated, something like that. Um, some kind of reason they would all come together, or even that the landscape became unsafe due to invaders. Um, as you can see from the Maidanetsky document, uh, sorry, the, 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 the plan of the, the, the magnetic research, um, there are walls, which are these thick, dark lines. Um, and uh, so the, the settlement was fortified, right? Uh, whereas these little towns in between, I don't know if they had their own fortifications. So it could have made sense that they sort of fled into the mega settlements, um, you know, kind of like how the population of medieval England would leave their villages and flee into the castles when you know, someone would come along and, you know, be burning the farms and, and doing whatever, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, this raises further questions like, you know, the people living out in the little towns, do they also own a, uh, a mega settlement house that's like theirs specifically? Or when there's a need, do you all just kind of go in and it's like first in best dressed as to who gets the best one or whatever. But anyway, super interesting. Uh, no one has any idea why they did this, but have a think about it. And if you come up with any genius ideas, then please let me know so that I can publish them and steal all the credit. Okay, moving on. Inside these mega settlements were things called mega structures, right? Which are very large structures. Um, we have a few ideas about what they actually were, but we're not going to put too many labels on them just yet. Um, at one of the mega settlements in a place called Nebelivka, um, a massive structure was found around 60 meters long and 20 meters wide, probably two stories high, which is interpreted by archaeologists as being a temple, right? Now let's talk about the process of interpretation in archaeology especially when it comes to buildings. Again, without a writing system, and even usually with a writing system, there's usually no way of knowing specifically what something was, right? Um, we don't, when we build buildings today, like a library or a grocery store or something, we don't usually go and leave a convenient note in the foundations that says this was a grocery store for archaeologists in 500 years, right? Archaeologists have to figure out what a building was used for based on what is contained within it, right? The objects and unfortunately sometimes the people um, that, you know, like in the case of Pompeii, for example, where the bodies are still preserved. Um, what this means is that yeah, so we have to figure out what the contents of a building can tell us about what that building was being used for. Buildings in the ancient world weren't uh, as single function as they are today, right? In the Western world, we have very strong property laws. Most people tend to live in their own house, and even if they're renting, they'll be there for, you know, six months to a year at least before they move on to somewhere else. You know, we don't, we don't move around that much, right? Compare this to somewhere like Rome in its imperial period, where probably at least a third of the population was homeless at any given time, and a lot of the rest were living in insecure housing where they could have had to move out and move to somewhere else, and they could get kicked out with their landlord and they had no you know, renter's rights or anything like we do today, right? And even within structures, we like to have a dining room and a living room and a kitchen and a this and a that and a something else, right? Uh, and a specific bedroom and so on and so forth. In the ancient world, this wasn't necessarily the case. Rooms could be used and reused for different purposes. Um, and, you know, furniture was typically more general purpose, like ancient Greek houses, for example. Um, you know, the furniture, you know, you could lie down and sleep on it or you could sit on it. And what we would call a couch, like the one that I'm sitting on right now, um, could be something that you sleep on as well as just sort of sit and read or, you know, have a conversation with someone on as well, right? And so rooms could be multifunctional. Um, and this isn't always easy to see in the archaeological record because... The evidence that we have for a building is usually the moment at which that building is destroyed, right? Mostly because, you know, when it, when it 
it collapses, right? The walls fall in and the roof falls down and then it kind of traps whatever was in there at that point in time. But also because, you know, objects can move in and out of a space depending on how they're being used and if a given room is being used as a storehouse for six months of the year and then as a courthouse with you know judges and stuff for the next six months and it gets destroyed in its courthouse phase in its courthouse phase we don't see the um, say uh, stacks of grain or you know jars of um, olive oil that were in the room the other six months of the year and we have no idea that it was being used for that purpose because all of that evidence was taken out and you know a new bunch of objects were brought in that correlate to how it was being used when it was destroyed right <clears throat> so whenever we find a building there's always a process of interpretation right and trying to figure out what it was or what the several things it could have been based on what's inside and that's not always easy right so we call these things structures and then we you know tentatively apply labels to them unless we've got a really good idea based on lots of examples that we know for example say like ancient Greek temples very recognizable there's a very specific layout of rooms that have you know functions and like you know there's the columns and there's the shape of them and they come in certain ratios and you know you can easily at a glance tell the difference between a Roman temple and a Greek temple just by the way they're built um, and also there's plenty of examples of them still standing right there are no trapelia megastructures still standing it's been nearly 10,000 years the trees that they were made out of would have rotted long since right even if they hadn't been blown up in World War II or any of the other many 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 major conflicts that have occurred in this area since but this megastructure here in Nebelivka, we've decided, well, the archaeologists have decided to interpret as a temple based on a couple of things. Um, firstly, the X-shaped structures that resemble altars that were found within the structure. So these are structures within the structure. Um, as well as the remains of animals that appear to have been sacrificed because the bones are burnt rather than cooked. Um, anyone who's ever eaten lamb shanks, for example, you, you know the difference between bones that have been cooked and bones that have been burnt. Anyone who's ever eaten something that I cooked uh, will definitely know what burnt bones look like because I suck at cooking. Um, but burnt bones are that way because they weren't intended to be eaten. They've been burned at a higher temperature for longer until they're charred, right? Um, so this tells us that it's a sacrifice because because burning animals on an altar was a really common way of sacrificing things to the gods in the ancient world, right? Um, interestingly, the Nebelivka temple is aligned precisely with the point where the sun would have ridden, uh, where the sun would have risen, sun's on a horse um, in some cultures, um, where the sun would have risen on the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year, right? This is the same as the famous Karnak temple in Egypt, right? So these Trapillion guys clearly had very advanced astronomical knowledge in that they could build this quite large structure, this rectangular thing, and align it perfectly so that one side of it aligns perfectly with where the sun would rise on one specific day right so they clearly were good enough at you know maths and stuff like that they could figure out exactly where that was going to be we now speculate that there was like you know windows or some kind of like doors that were opened up on this day and then the morning sun would stream right in and illuminate you know an altar or some kind of sacred object or something like that this is just speculation but you know the exact same thing happens at temples in egypt and all other kinds of places around the world right but Super cool. So these, these Ukrainian dudes, they really knew what they were doing. And now, coming to the last thing that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, there's another uh, mega structure in Maidanetsky, which is the, the place that I just showed you a minute ago with the, uh, the magnetic records, right? Um, which is interpreted by a different set of archaeologists, because archaeologists often differ in how they interpret things as a communal production center, because the remains that are found within this structure correlate to the remains that are found in production areas in people's houses where they're doing domestic activities like cooking food storage and eating eating produces different remains to cooking um, you know like bones that have you can you can noticeably tell they've been chewed on and gnawed on um, you know and, and, and then tossed away and discarded so on and so forth they found the and you know cooking implements and and you know bits of food and, and such and such like um, so this kind of stuff that's found in people's houses has also been found in this megastructure in Maidanetsky. So some other archaeologists interpreted it as basically a giant um, domestic production center where it's things like you know, cooking and um, 
maybe even domestic activities like weaving and clothes production and stuff were being done on a large scale. All the kind of things that people were doing in their homes, just bigger, right? Um, more of it, right? I personally don't think this necessarily means that the structure wasn't being used for religious purposes. As I said, structures could be multi uh, multi-purpose in the ancient world, um, and the very strict ideas that we have, particularly in in countries that have got a tradition of Christianity, about how you know the temple is the house of God, and uh, you know you don't do other things in there. There's that scene in the Bible where Jesus absolutely flips his shit uh, when he goes to the temple, um, and people are like trading and doing other things in the temple, um, which like you have to see this from the perspective of of the ancient culture it wasn't fine for jesus but it was totally normal for everybody else right unfortunately it's just it's just jesus opinion that we've built all of our opinions on since right but if you look at it from the perspective of everyone else who was there happily trading in the temple they viewed that as a totally normal thing to do right and there would have been plenty of other cultures all around the world where sacred spaces could also be spaces for communal activities, you know, production activities, commercial activities, and so on and so forth. And they would have not seen a problem with that at all, right? So we can't be too um, instinctively biased uh, by our own traditions in seeing those traditions in what we're excavating. Um, which is exactly what I want to talk to you about next, right? Because when the Trapilia culture was first being investigated by archaeologists, they interpreted it as a classless, egalitarian society where everyone was equal and there wasn't a rich and a poor and there wasn't a hierarchy and there wasn't leaders. There was Everyone was just equal and they were living in this utopia, right? Um, and the megastructures with evidence for communal production were a big part of the reason why they were interpreted in this way, right? It is totally unsurprising to me that these archaeologists who interpreted this egalitarian society were part of communist Soviet Russia, which was what Ukraine was part of at the time, right? This was obviously an extremely popular idea. These guys that are coming from a communist background where they're, well, a, an, an attempting to be communist country where they're trying to have a, a society that's completely equal and no one has any more power or any more wealth than anybody else and then sure enough they interpreted that in the archaeological science that they were excavating because that's just what we do we see what we want to see and we see things that are similar to our own patterns of thinking right um, this was also very popular for the Soviet government because with this archaeological evidence of an egalitarian society, they could use that to back up their communist political philosophy and to justify the existence of the USSR and of the Russian Revolution by saying that you know this ancient society is how people were quote unquote meant to live or how we originally live, and that you know then nasty capitalists came along and ruined it and them as the communists were just sort of restoring humankind to its its natural state of being, right? Um, so again, just like the Russians are doing now, they were using and manipulating Ukrainian history and culture for their own political purposes. Sadly, unfortunately, it's just a process that they've been doing for thousands of years and probably will continue to do so. The problem is that as these sites continue to be examined, um, more evidence emerged which cast doubt on this theory, right? And it became more and more to be seen that the Trapillians were not egalitarian at all. They were actually quite hierarchical and there were, there were you know, wealth inequalities and there were different social and socioeconomic classes, just like in every other society in the world, right? So not terribly uh, surprising. Um, also not terribly hard to figure out. You know, if everyone's equal and if you've got all these thousands of different houses from Maidanetsky, then everyone should have the same shit in all of their houses, right? But if there's inequality, then you would find different remains in each of the houses and some of them would be wealthier and some of them would be not, right? And I do not know of a city in the, in the world at any point in time in any culture that has ever actually had all of these houses where everyone has the same stuff, you know? But anyway, so archaeologists became quite convinced that there was actually plenty of social class divisions and inequalities in material wealth. So the Soviets banned the research, right? And uh, academics who tried to publish books about it were silenced, thrown in jail, or they just sort of disappeared, which means they got shot and thrown in the river. Um, all the typical Soviet communist stuff, you know, as soon as an idea comes up that they don't like, they shut it down, right? Um, so... 
Yeah, so this is one of the main reasons why the Trapilia culture isn't more known in the Western world, because so much of this archaeological research was going on behind the Iron Curtain, and you know during the um, the, the period of time, during the Cold War, during the period of time when the USSR was not at all friends with the rest, right? So a lot of this archaeological research was done very much from this communist perspective, and also these archaeologists had guns to their heads to interpret it in a way that backed up what the USSR wanted to already find there and now archaeologists are or have since the you know since the Iron Curtain came down have been reinterpreting all that evidence and you know, making fresh excavations and um, and you know, and building a, a much more realistic picture of the Trapillion society which is as I said more hierarchical um, and more distinct in its social classes so uh, there you go but anyway that's all I have to tell you about the Trapillion so far today thank you very much for watching um, make sure you subscribe hit the notifications icon so you can so you, you catch all of my future videos um, I'm thinking about doing some more videos on the cultures of Ukraine um, as this conflict continues I think it's not a bad thing to do to raise more awareness about this area um, we covered the Stone Age today but there is some amazing stuff from Ukraine from the later Iron Age which corresponds roughly to what you'd think of for, you know like classical Greece and Rome um, the Cimmerians, the Sarmatians and the Scythians you might have heard of some of them I could easily do a video about each of them um, if not one altogether. But if that's something you're keen on, let me know in the comments down below and I'll think about making it over the weekend. Um, and as I said, like and subscribe. Uh, hit the notification icon so you don't miss out on any future videos I make about Ukraine or about any of my future videos in general. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dan and thanks for watching this episode of ADBC History. I'll catch you in the next one.